Funding for lawmakers comes from the University of West Georgia in Carrollton, ensuring a better life for Georgians in the 21st century. More than 100 programs of study prepare students for successful careers in the critical professions of education and nursing, as well as business and the liberal arts. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of Georgia's business community, over 4,000 members strong, working with lawmakers for over 90 years to make sure that our state remains a place where companies thrive and by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Coming up on Lawmakers, the House spares Hope Book Grants, at least temporarily. Senate Democrats prepare to drop their second legislative ethics bill this session. And we take a look at three bills that aim to relax restrictions on gun owners. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelski. Hello, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, Republicans disagree on the $1 cigarette tax. And we preview two pieces of Governor Sonny Perdue's education legislation. But first, our top story tonight, the Hope Book stipend is preserved in the House. The House today agreed to new triggers for the Hope Scholarship book stipend. Representative Ben Harbin explains that House Bill 157 balances the need to maintain lottery reserves and provide scholarships. If they were to come down next year by just as little as $1, then we would be required, the lottery board would be required to cut the book fees in half for all Hope Scholar recipients across the state. If it were to go down by just another dollar the following year, they would have to take away those book fees uh, completely the following year. So what we've done here is establish what we think are a better or more accurate trigger mechanism before they start that reduction of book fees. The first year is 8% from the highest audited reserve fund. If it falls by 8%, then half of the book fees would be pulled. If it falls by 16 the following year, or total of 16, they would be pulled uh, to do away with the book fees. And then 25% in the third year, it would do away with the student fees. Whereas today, it's just really $3 is all it would have to fall over three years for that, uh, for that to occur. House Bill 157 passed 159 to 0. It now moves to the Senate. A similar measure was adopted by the General Assembly last year and was then vetoed by Governor Perdue. The Senate gave unanimous passage to a bill today that allows students with certain allergic reactions to carry self-administered injectable epinephrine. Senator Jack Murphy, who sponsors Senate Bill 8, begins and is then followed by Senator Seth Harp. What this bill does is direct the local school boards to adopt a policy that will allow students to carry and self-administer injectable epinephrine to treat any life-threatening uh, allergies that they might have from um, nuts or fish or whatever they might be uh, eating. It's just closing a, a loophole. This is a epinephrine um, pen, if any of you hadn't ever seen it, it's, uh, it's, it's auto-injectable, it's uh, already preloaded, so they carry this with them and they can inject it. Uh, the bill also calls for a note from the doctor saying that they're eligible, that they have, that they can self-inject this, and it also uh, allows the uh, nurses, school nurses, to uh, give it to them in case they're in shock and it, and it relieves the school systems from any liability if um, they had any adverse reaction. Isn't this another reason why we need to have school nurses uh, to continue to be in the school systems and fund it? Uh, Senator from 34th, I uh, agree with you that we do need uh, school nurses. Anaphylactic shock, which is what that epinephrine uh, syrette is used for, you have about 15 minutes between somebody being alive and somebody having irreversible brain damage and being dead. Please support this legislation because the people that are propitiated towards anaphylactic shock, this means the difference between life and death. And unfortunately, children in school have this sort of situation. It's, it's ne these are never given out without a proper prescription and doctors giving it to appropriately. It does, ha does not have an inappropriate use. 
Again, Senate Bill 8 passed 51 to 0 and now goes over to the House. The House today voted to ratify two executive orders issued by the governor during last year's gas price spike. In about May, when the governor started looking at what would happen due to the record fuel prices we were experiencing at the time, he decided to suspend that uh, otherwise rate increase, which resulted in a $71.5 million tax savings for our citizens. Uh, this bill would ratify that order. One consequence if we do not ratify it is that we will be required to go back and ret retroactive collect this tax from the distributors, which eventually will be passed to the actual suppliers, which would result in a very quick spike in our uh, taxes on, on gas to uh, collect that. So. Basically what this executive order done was suspended the state's portion of the sales tax on off-road or dyed fuel for the period that ends May the 31st. And that's all that it does. If we do not ratify this order, then you and I are going to have to go back to our constituents in our district and ask them to pay this taxes. And actually, the person that sells that diesel fuel is going to have to pay it, and then they will have to go out to the customers and get them to pay it. Both House Bill 46 and House Bill 121 passed without opposition and now moved to the Senate. Ethics reform measures continue from Senate Democrats. Senate Minority Whip David Edelman took the well this morning to encourage fellow senators to sign on to a bill that closes a loophole that allows candidates to transfer campaign funds from their campaigns over to other campaigns. As you know, individuals or corporations who contribute to legislative campaigns have limitations on the amount they can contribute to each campaign. However, the current law contains a loophole that allows legislators from their campaign account to make contributions to other legislative candidates. This has become a loophole that has allowed a Mack truck through so that individuals or corporations who want to support a candidate not only can give the maximum amount to that candidate, but can also give to other candidates with some implicit understanding that ultimately both checks will go to support a single campaign. What this bill will do is it will prohibit legislators or candidates from legislative offices from writing checks out of their campaign accounts to other legislative campaign committees. I'm going to leave it over here with the Secretary of the Senate. I hope you'll come review it. I hope you'll join me in signing this bill. Now, Senator Edelman said this is the second of many ethics reform bills to come this session. The first, SB 70, dropped by Senator George Hooks last week, aims to close another loophole dealing with campaign contributions from companies contracted through the state. Well, a trio of bills now under consideration in the General Assembly would relax existing gun laws for licensed gun owners. This time last year, we were talking about House Bill 89, the so-called parking lot gun bill, which expanded the list of places licensed gun owners with a concealed carry permit may take their weapons. And despite indications from Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle that he will not allow the issue of expanded gun rights to come to the Senate floor, three pieces of legislation being considered could do just that. Lawmakers Valerie Edwards has more. The first measure, SB 9, sponsored by Republican Senator John Davis, repeals an existing law requiring that guns be holstered even while in some public places. From the House side, House Bill 155, sponsored by Republican James Mills, allows gun permit applicants to choose either a renewable five-year license or a lifetime carry license at a cost of $40 a year. And finally, House Bill 182 from freshman Republican Representative Rick Austin would allow the discharge of firearms, and I'm paraphrasing a language from the bill here, firearms could be discharged on tracks of property of five or more acres, even those located within a county or municipality. Supporters of the proposed new gun rule say Georgia's strict gun laws currently violate the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. John Monroe is vice president of GeorgiaCarry.org. 
Georgia is one of the most restrict, actually the most restrictive law in our state in the country as far as uh, laws on where you can carry firearms. Well, I'd say to the, uh, the people who are critical of HB 18 and last year predicted there, that there would be blood in the streets and that hasn't happened. I mean there really haven't been any negative effects from people now being able to allowed, uh, being able to carry uh, firearms uh, in restaurants that serve alcohol or on public transportation. I'm not aware of any incidents involving a person with a license to carry a firearm uh, in one of those places that's now available to them. Now all three proposed new gun measures, Senate Bill 9 and House Bills 155 and 182 have been referred to their respective chambers, uh, respective, uh, sorry, Judiciary Committees. But as I mentioned earlier, the Lieutenant Governor signaled before the current session even began that he would allow discussion on the expansion of gun laws to come to the floor. He would not allow it to come to the floor of the Senate. Now, although the state budget would benefit from federal dollars, House Majority Leader Jerry Keene told reporters today that he's not sure the General Assembly will have time to wait for Congress to act. There doesn't seem to be a lot of progress on the Senate side in Washington as far as the stimulus package. A number of senators, both Republican and Democrat, came out just a couple hours ago saying they think it's too large, it's too large a package. And so our hope was that they would have this resolved prior to their break, which I think is at the end of next week. If that doesn't happen, the next sort of target date is Easter. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, my hope is, and my belief is, that I will be spending Easter at home and not in Atlanta. So uh, if that's the case, any impact on the budget, uh, we'll simply have to produce our budgets without any impact of federal dollars. Keene also addressed the differences between the House and Senate transportation proposals. He says the, that Representative Vance Smith's statewide transportation plan makes more sense than the Senate proposal to levy regional transportation special local option sales taxes, or TSPLOS. Counties now can do a TSPLOS. It's, it's already in the law. They have the ability through the SPLOS now to do transportation projects today in their own county. Um, and in many counties they've done that, included my own. The only answer I have to that is let's give them an opportunity. I think one of the reasons we like to go ahead and vote on this initiative and get it out there is to give the voters of Georgia time to understand the plan. Sometimes all they hear is somebody says, oh, well, this is going to raise your sales tax. Yeah, but what are you going to get for that? Supporters of House Bill 39 say a $1 tax increase on a pack of cigarettes would bring the state $2.5 billion in long-term health care savings. Today, Georgia doctors asked legislators to pass the buck. Lawmakers Emily Banks has more. Doctors from around the state, including Howard McMahon, appealed to the legislature to pass House Bill 39. This could raise the state more money for tobacco prevention and health care. One of the biggest barriers that I faced has been dealing with tobacco cessation. It is something that I see not just at arm's length, I see every day on an up-close and personal basis. Uh, we know that tobacco use is uh, responsible for, over the past four decades, over 12 million deaths in the United States. The tax increase could also help prevent smoking among teens, as Dr. Jacqueline Fincher explained. We know that increasing the tobacco tax directly helps to prevent and decrease smoking in all age groups, but especially teenagers because you price them out of it. Representative Ron Stevens, the bill's sponsor, told the group the state should at least meet the national average. But at a separate conference today, House Majority Leader Jerry Keene said he and other Republican leaders plan to stick to a no new taxes guarantee. Now, if we tack on another dollar on top of that in Georgia, let me tell you what will happen. You'll force more sales underground, bootleg, and you're going to force more sales across the border. Georgia's a large border state. Georgia's current excise tax is 37 cents, one of the lowest in the country. House Bill 39 has yet to be taken up in committee to determine whether pass the buck makes sense. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Emily Banks. Portions of Governor Purdue's education agenda are in committee in both the House and Senate. Earlier, I talked to House Education Chairman Brooks Coleman about proposed educator incentives, beginning with House Bill 282. What we're trying to do is find, identify, and reward, and just uh, certify the best teachers that we can find in our state. House Bill 282 would offer salary bonuses to educators who earn master teacher or distinguished teacher leader certification. Highly qualified math and science teachers could receive pay incentives if House Bill 280 is adopted. 
we're saying that if you're a math and science teacher, you'll start at the fifth level. And it would mean, could mean anywhere from, we're hoping around four or five thousand dollars additional pay for a math teacher. The higher salaries for math and science teachers is already included in the Department of Education budget. But in these tough economic times, funding salary bonuses may be tough. I think we're looking at possibly 2011, 2012, when we start the, we can go ahead and start the program, start identifying, and I think uh, hopefully by then when the economy uh, it gets better, we'll find, be able to find the funds, you know, be able to appropriate because it's one thing the bill says, the one of the paragraphs, you know, pending funding by the legislature. Tomorrow on Lawmakers, we'll visit an Atlanta public school where math and science education is on a fast track, plus a third portion of the governor's education agenda, pay incentives for outstanding principals. That's tomorrow on Lawmakers. We invite you to check out GPB's online resources at gpb.org lawmakers. Find the latest from GPB's radio news team and watch lawmakers online. All that and more at gpb.org lawmakers. We invite you to visit that site and vote in our legislative issue poll. We'll bring you the results of that poll later this week. Well, a measure to make the lack of seatbelt use admissible in court as evidence was given a due pass by the Senate Judiciary Committee today. Senate Bill 23 sponsor Senator Lee Hawkins explains. This bill really pertains to the admissibility in court of a person's failure to wear a seatbelt and that failure may be considered in, in, by a jury or a judge as a contributory factor in determining damages. We live in a society that has now become the thought process and the right of, the right of the people to obtain medical um, <coughs> care. Sometimes there is more than just a right, but there's a responsibility involved with that. We as a society have the responsibility to pay for that medical care. And with that thought in mind, I think we as a society has, have a responsibility for our part and the causation of that care. Now, critics argued that the bill will not encourage more people to wear seat belts and would actually shift the cost to the victims. An amendment to that bill was presented, which passed, that includes trucks in the legislation. Currently, truck passengers do not legally have to wear seat belts. This legislation could pose a problem if the House does not change that law. Again, SB 23 narrowly passed by a vote of 5 to 4 and now moves to Senate rules. Georgians could soon get flu shots without an individual doctor's prescription under legislation approved by the House Health and Human Services Committee today. Representative Jimmy Pruitt, one of Governor Sonny Perdue's floor leaders, is the sponsor of House Bill 217. This is uh, one of the governor's bills, 217, House Bill 217, and it's access to the Flu Vaccine Act. Um, the purpose behind this is obviously that under the economic times we're under now that we need to make flu vaccines as easy to get to as possible. The Attorney General did have some problems with the way that it was being done and this clarifies that by, by changing the law to allow physicians to issue protocol agreements uh, with pharmacies and nurses so that they can give the flu vaccine um, without the physician having to have a particular prescription for each individual. Now, after some debate, an amended version of House Bill 217 received a due pass recommendation. Also on the committee's agenda, House Bill 194, which also received a due pass recommendation. That legislation sponsored by Representative Fran Millar requires the inclusion of additional information when generic drugs are substituted for brand name prescriptions. Both bills now go to House rules. County tax assessors may soon have to consider foreclosure or bank-owned sales of comparable property in determining fair market value. The Senate Finance Committee gave a due pass recommendation by substitute to Senate Bill 55 today. Senator Chip Pearson, the bill sponsor, explains. Well, Senate Bill 55 basically requires that uh, tax assessors in the appraisal process for the local county digest that they take into account foreclosed properties or bank owned properties uh, when they do that uh, reassessment. So what could all this mean for homeowners whose property values have declined due to foreclosures in their neighborhood? Senator Pearson says it could mean a property tax decrease, but that outcome will not be immediate. If I were to sell today uh, and there was a foreclosure in my neighborhood, would that have an impact on the value of my home? Absolutely. So how would it impact the taxes? It will, if this bill becomes law, 
eventually, but it conceivably could take two or three years depending on where the county is in their reassessment process and where this particular parcel fits in there. The committee substitute also includes provisions to include the impact of real estate transfer tax declarations and land conservation easements. That substitute to Senate Bill 55 now goes to Senate Rules. The Georgia Nuclear Energy Financing Act received a due pass from the Senate Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee yesterday, but not without some struggle. Lawmakers Brittany Evans has the details. In a continuation of last week's hearing, the committee heard testimonial after testimonial fighting for and against SB 31. SB 31 would allow utility companies to charge customers to cover the cost of building nuclear power plants before the plants are built. By the end of the afternoon, it came down to a substitute from Senator Doug Stoner against a substitute from Senate Bill 31 sponsor Don Balfour, which clarified the original bill. Senator Balfour explained. You say, man, this is a bad time to do that. First of all, we're not doing it for two years. Secondly, we, most of us in this room the other day voted for a 16 percent increase in sales tax that the people could vote on. This is a 1 percent increase and it saves the consumers money. Senator Stoner, on the other hand, felt that the decision should stay with the Public Service Commission, which usually makes utility rate decisions. The PSC is currently hearing this case and will decide on March 17th when Georgia Power can charge for the new plans. Senator Stoner explained why SB 31 isn't necessary. There's really no reason that the legislature even has to weigh in on this issue. Now, we're right in the middle of a rate case on this whole subject matter that's going to be decided by March 17th by the Public Service Commission. Um, as to some issues concerning the ability in the future of the PSC changing its mind, uh, my, uh, my substitute addressed that concern. And so if we address that concern, then I see no reason uh, that uh, the PSC shouldn't have the final decision on these issues. After voting favorably for Senator Balfour's substitution, the committee ruled 8-2 to two to give a due pass to SB 31. Now that bill moves on to the Rules Committee. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Brittany Evans. A large crowd rallied on the Capitol steps for Women Against Violence Day to voice their concerns about budget cuts to domestic violence programs. Lawmakers Tiana Fernandez has the story. Domestic violence programs provide assistance to approximately 10,000 women and children a year. Without the help from the General Assembly, these agencies are facing cuts of about $5,000 to $7,000 in 2010. Executive Director of Georgia Commission on Family Violence, Beck Dunn, says legislators need to act now. They cannot wait for conditions to improve. They cannot wait for the economy to recover. They cannot wait for us to find room for them in our services and shelters. They need us now. Despite the cold, the crowd bundled up to listen to the compelling stories from survivors of domestic violence. I was abducted by a complete stranger and um, taken 